So we're talking about this really interesting time we're in for content moderation and online platforms. We've seen a lot happen last year, both with the election and with the pandemic um, and with social movements around the world. And now we're seeing a little bit of a tension between the values of free expression and some other possibly conflicting values, right? Things like, you know, concern for individual health and safety online, uh, concern for election integrity, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, so with that, I would actually like to ask each of our panelists to briefly introduce yourselves um, and give maybe, you know, one to two minute high level overview of your thoughts on this situation. Uh, so where are we in 2021 with free expression and content moderation of the tech platforms? Uh, so we don't have an order here. We're not sitting in a row today. Uh, so whoever would like to start with that. Hey, glad to start, Tiffany. Go ahead. Uh, Steve Del Bianco with NetChoice, a trade association that uh, tries to make the internet safe for free expression and free enterprise. So I think it's, uh, as we look at 2021, the way you've teed it up, I think it's still true, more true than ever, that Americans love to share their own news and views without the traditional media filter, uh, that we love to write and read reviews of restaurants, travel, and resorts and on places like Yelp. We, uh, we love to look at product reviews on places like uh, Amazon or Etsy. We love to buy and sell on platforms where a small craft person or a service provider can come together. Etsy and Thumbtack, for instance, provide that kind of a benefit to all of us. And I think it's more true than ever that posting and contributing on places like GoFundMe and Kickstarter is really popular with Americans. And it's also true that all of those platform activities are made possible because of Section 230, since it avoids the ability to be sued for things that others have said or sued for taking down things that you didn't think were appropriate. Uh, I would also add for 2021 that this country still has the First Amendment. And the First Amendment makes it very difficult for government, in particular Congress, to step in and regulate the editorial content that happens on these platforms. So 2021 will mostly be about working the refs, working the refs on social media and content, mainly because it kind of works and partly because, because of the First Amendment, this pretty much all the government can do. Now, for those of you that enjoy it, it'll be fun to watch the executives of my industry squirming in congressional hearings. And I can tell you that from the standpoint of our industry, it is frightening to have those attacks from both sides on social media moderation. The one side that wants more moderation and the other side that wants less. So sit back and enjoy the show for 2021. Hi, Tiffany. I'm happy to jump in. Um, my name is Nora Benavides. I'm the director of US Free Expression Programs at PEN America. And um, it was so great hearing that introduction, um, at least from a completely different sector. I don't know about you. I often time myself to hear how soon into a debate uh, Section 230 gets introduced. So uh, it was about 30 seconds in, but um, which is good. Let's rip the Band-Aid. But, uh, you know, at PEN America, we're an organization of writers and allies uh, promoting the freedom to write and freedom of expression. And over the last many years, we grew concerned over the way that words have been weaponized to sway public opinion, to sow doubt, division, and chaos. And over the last several years, we have been investigating what is happening, um, the ways that it has become harder for us to come to together with shared knowledge, um, the ways that disinformation and online abuse and the kind of toxic vitriol online have created very weird ecosystems, all the while local journalism has declined and people often don't quite know where to turn for credible information. And I think as Tiffany laid out in the beginning, it's really kind of been a perfect storm of all of these compounding crises. And this last year really seemed to illuminate for so many experts why there is urgency, how there is a very direct corollary between what we see about the infodemic and what we do with our bodies and to keep our bodies safe. I think then the election showed us that the kinds of misleading narratives and realities that people have believed in for years uh, have real world effects on our democracy. And so we see our role as really trying to make sense of for people what's at stake. 
Um, we work on disinformation, online abuse, and anti-harassment techniques for journalists. Of course, I am a lawyer by training, and I run our First Amendment agenda and our national advocacy at PEN America. And I think in the next year, we're going to see uh, hopefully a flashpoint where everyday people and experts can actually see that these issues have very real world consequences. And where the platforms have accountability, I think we can talk a lot here today about removing, reducing, informing users um, and how interdisciplinary solutions are necessary ahead. I'm happy to jump in, uh, unless you want to start, Juan. Please. OK, uh, I'm Jamal Green. I am a professor of law at Columbia Law School. Uh, I'm also, maybe as most relevant to this panel, uh, I'm a co-chair of the Oversight Board, uh, which uh, people in this audience are probably somewhat familiar with. But it's a, an independent body that was set up by Facebook to uh, be kind of the last appeals process for content decisions uh, on Facebook and on Instagram. Uh, we are uh, a, a new institution, so just um, started last summer, just took our first cases a couple of months ago, uh, expect to be announcing our first cases uh, literally within days. Uh, and as many of you are certainly aware, uh, in recent days, Facebook uh, referred to the Oversight Board uh, its decision to indefinitely suspend uh, the account of Donald Trump and so we're in the process of deliberating about that right now. Um, to the question of 2021, you know, I, I, I think it's in many ways uh, certainly continuous with 2020, um, except that maybe there's a little bit, it, it, the stakes are maybe a little bit clearer to people than they may have been in the past. Um, you know, if you are someone who believed that um, speech can never harm anyone, then um, you got a, a, a wake up call a few weeks ago. Um, if you are someone who believes that speech should be readily regulated, um, you may not necessarily want um, the CEOs of, 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 of social media platforms to be the ones who do that. So I, I think as we think about what's what the future looks like, uh, certainly from my vantage point in my corner of this conversation, uh, building new institutions, building institutions that are um, not necessarily uh, in bed with the tech companies, but also not government institutions, uh, and trying to figure out um, how to how to structure those institutions. Uh, I, I think that that is the future of content moderation, whether it's the precise structure of the oversight board or something else. Um, I think remains to be seen, but uh, but I do think trying to create these kind of intermediate institutions is going to be incredibly important. So thank you very much. My name is uh, Juan Barata. I'm a fellow at the Center for Internet and Society and the Cyber Policy Center at, at Stanford University. I also work uh, for many international organizations um, around the world on uh, freedom of expression, media regulation issues in, in different countries and, and regions. So, I mean, I think that I'll take basically a, a legal angle to, to this discussion. And what I see when it comes to, I mean, 2021 is that that apart from, I mean, these discussions on content moderation, I, I believe we'll see lots of discussions on regulation of content moderation. Huh? Regulation either by independent bodies, independent new self-regulatory bodies, as it was just it was just mentioned, but also regulation via statutory a statutory a statutory laws, a statutory uh, provisions. And I have, I'll, I'll, of course, I mean, uh, what comes to mind in, in this context is Section 230, but uh, today I would also like to talk a little bit about the Digital Services Act, uh, because I think it's, it's a very interesting initiative, not only from the European perspective, but also because I believe that the, the debate during 2021 about the DSA, which will be really intense, I think will have a strong influence on American debates and will have a strong influence on the way um, freedom of expression is reconsidered within the world, with the online world. And this time, um, because of timing, because of 
political reasons, etc., it seems that the European Union will be taking the lead, not only uh, with regards to the, the United States, but I believe also that the way this conversation takes place in Europe will also have a strong influence in the way new laws in this field are adopted in Southeast Asia, Latin America, etc., etc. And we already saw in the past that some uh, laws, some regulations adopted in Europe have, have been completely twisted in authoritarian environments to restrict freedom of expression. So I think that this is something, as I said, this European experience is something that has to be of our concern beyond Europe, huh? because I think that this is a conversation that will be really influential beyond the, the EU borders and particularly, if I may say, in the United States. Thank you. Great, thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, as I think as everyone in the audience can see, we have a breadth of experience here on many different topics. Um, and it is something that is really crucial as from freedom of expression for the US, from the private sector, public sector, uh, but also as Joan was mentioning for inter the international world, right? Freedom of expression globally is something that is currently potentially at risk. And there are things that could be done maybe from our tech sector and possibly from our US policymakers as well. So I'd like to start with just a very basic question. Uh, if we start from the standpoint of everyone valuing free expression, and we all sort of believe that that's a good thing to have and to support, what are the greatest threats right now? What threats do you see to uh, this idea that we at least once had, which was that the internet could be a vector for free expression. What are some threats either, you know, market-based or government-based or society-based that you see coming now? I think it's important to understand these so we can try to figure out solutions. And if you can just raise your hand um, either virtually or physically, and I think I can see you from here. Sure, John. Thank you very much, because this looks a little bit like a legal question. Uh, so, no, what I would say is that, I mean, from my point of view, I mean, the most important threat is um, this intention by governments uh, to force platforms to do more, because this has been some sort of a rationale, some sort of a music that we have been listening to, we have been hearing in the course of the of the last years. Platforms should do, must do more when it comes to dealing with terrorist content, elections, COVID, the dissemination of information or hate speech in, a, let's say, vulnerable environments, so on and so forth. So I think that states may have the temptation to force via legislation platforms to police not only illegal content, but also harmful content. So in other words, states may be tempted to use platforms to take down content that they couldn't take down by themselves. So they would instrumentalize, delegate on platforms, uh, <laughs> the, this function of restricting speech beyond the boundaries of what would be acceptable in terms of international standards. So I think that, I mean, the, the, let's say the most important threat now is the change in the terms of the conversation when it comes to the regulation of social media, because the stress is put on risks, the stress is put on the idea of risk mitigation, and the, the assessment of the impact on freedom of expression, basically, I mean, it's very hard to find it. I mean, you, you hear some general say, statements made by companies that, no, well, but in any case, we will respect international standards, but we still don't know what, what that means exactly. So I think that I see this as an important threat. We've seen that already in countries like the United Kingdom or Germany, for example. And I think that we may also see this in other parts of the world. Great, thank you. And Steve? Thanks, uh, Joan. When you bring up Europe as a comparison, there are two important differences. I'm not a lawyer, but I do understand that in Europe and the rest of the world, the English rule prevails for lawsuits. And under the English rule, the loser pays. So aggressive lawsuits brought against platforms for things that were said or taken down don't happen nearly as much around the rest of the world as they happen here. And the second is the US has a much stricter rule through the First Amendment than the freedom of expression principles that are embraced in other parts of the world. So that creates a very particular environment in the U.S. where lawsuit abuse becomes 
the key problem, the threat, if you will, is because Tiffany asked us about threats. The key threat is lawsuits, lawsuits over content that was posted by someone else or lawsuits over content that a platform decided to take down. And that is all under a microscope because on January the 6th, we all watched what happened at the U.S. Capitol. And who among you wouldn't have seen that and been um, actually frightened? Maybe if you were at the controls over at Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook, you would have cranked down the dial on how much speech you're going to allow the afternoon of January the 6th. And that's why I think we saw a rather significant reaction. Because content moderation decisions are not done in the abstract. They're done in the context of real-world events. They're done in the context of which side of our government's in power, the one that wants more moderation or the one that wants less moderation. Those are the realities. And so is the competition. There are plenty of other social media platforms whose moderation practices are different, perhaps, than yours. And that might be, a, that might be an attractive for audience and advertisers to move over there. So all of these taken together are threats. And I, I would love to compare more to Europe. But let's keep in mind those fundamental differences of lawsuit abuse and the First Amendment. Great. Nora? So, uh, I mean... <laughs> it's hard to think of what are the most urgent threats because uh, there's a variety of entry points. Um, but I, there are two that I would sort of put forth. One is the ongoing and what I think is perennial problem of the speed of proliferation of bad content. Um, and I'm making no real distinction, as Joan did brilliantly, between harmful versus illegal content. Um, the, the spread and the speed of spread is so hard that from a pragmatic perspective, it is almost impossible to ever really get in front of the problem. Um, if we're looking at automated and human solutions, whether in concert or humans reviewing what uh, AI does, it's really hard to ever get in front of something. Um, and we know very little from the platforms, the unknown aspects of um, you know, impressions of a certain piece of content on people. Um, we don't have that from Facebook. So that's a problem. And I think that the speed is one where it's just it's really hard to tactically imagine how to implement solutions. So that's one. I think the other, though, is the potential threat in this moment, in, in the next few years, of overcorrection. Um, that we may, in fact, reach a point where we are um, eager to set precedent, uh, to use a legal term. But for those that aren't lawyers, to think about how something like the Oversight Board or another mechanism that can govern um, would essentially create precedent that has really troubling consequences consequences um, in the future, whether it is for other international leaders or others. And that in this moment, so many people have called on, you know, we know experts, for example, are generally supportive of the ban uh, by, you know, by Facebook and Twitter of Trump. And yet, what will we see when overcorrection becomes something that actually hampers free expression, uh, instead of really allows us to think through what are the threat assessment models that we could be implementing? What are the very careful nuances? frameworks that we need to be asking questions about now. So I'll, uh, I'll jump in uh, both because all others have spoken and because uh, Nora mentioned the, the oversight board. Um, uh, I, that I was think pretty small. It was perfect. <laughs> exactly. Um, I, I, I think gen generally speaking, if I were, you know, to, I, as Nora did I struggle to think of what's the overriding threat there? So much, so much of this is all interconnected. But if I had to put my my finger on a, a single underlying problem, I would say that the efficiency of what I'll call information capitalism, um, which is uh, the, the, that data is valuable um, in in all kinds of ways, and uh, when you have something that's really valuable. People are going to want to commodify it. People are going to want to. Um, opportunists will take advantage of it, and I try. I say that in the in a. I don't say that in a particularly pejorative way. I say it in the sense of, just in the sense that, uh, there's a lot of stuff going around, um, and there's no way uh, to manage it um, with clear, clean cut rules. Uh, you, you can only manage it contextually. And yet it's happening at a, a speed uh, and at a scale that makes that essentially impossible. And so uh, as I think about how do you address that kind of problem, I, I'm not, I don't have all the answers for sure. 
But I do think that uh, ju just to f again focus on the oversight board at least, I think the thing that the oversight board can can try to deliver is some degree of trust, which is to say that there are all kinds of reasons not to trust governments uh, to regulate content. There are all kinds of reasons not to, to trust private companies to regulate content. And what we're trying to do, I think, with the oversight board, and again, I, I, I want to be humble about this ambition, right, is to try to create institutions uh, that don't have uh, perverse incentives, knowing that these are always going to be hard questions. Um, try, to, try, to ha try to construct institutions that will answer them as thoughtfully uh, and as independently as possible. Tiffany, can I do a quick follow-up? I, I completely right, agree with Nora's point that we want to avoid overcorrection, but I do want to be, um, I want to do want to be understanding about Jamal's point that we may have to experiment with different approaches. The oversight board as an institution, independent institution is an experiment worth having. We always fear overcorrection. Um, there are other experiments. The social media platform MeWe doesn't rely on ad rev to provide its services. It charges, it charges me $5 a month to be in the platform. So we're going to see experiments that may not rely as heavily on the monetization of data. We'll see whether people want to pay for what they get for free today. And, and uh, perhaps an oversight board that allows a transparent discussion of an important question, like for political leaders, what are the cultural and what are the political and legal ramifications of giving them a voice or denying them a voice? And what degree of moderation is necessary? I'd, I'd love for us to be less focused on Trump, the person, and what he says, and focus more on what the rules should be going forward for platforms that would adhere to the Facebook Oversight Board. Those platforms are going to want to understand what are the future rules when the leaders of a country use the Internet as a soapbox. Really interesting. Uh, definitely a lot of issues that you all raise right now. Um, I'm really interested in this idea of context, which I think a number of you mentioned, this idea that content moderation has to be done in context. And that's been a core complaint, um, especially among people, uh, users in the global south, I've heard, um, because a lot of the content moderation decisions aren't done, um, and the content moderators aren't situated uh, in the places where the decisions are being made, where the policies are being written in one country and implemented on another country. Uh, so if we think about the internet as a, you know, a global community and each of these platforms as having potentially global reach, how do we balance these ideals of, you know, US-based First Amendment free expression uh, and, you know, the, the strength that we have um, for our private sector here uh, versus some countries or some regions that don't have the same values? How do we deal with those tensions? And is there a way to move forward that, you know, allows for us to support free expression on a global, uh, global level and not just on a U.S. level or not just on an EU level? I can try to get started on, on this, which, uh, which is, of course, a, a very difficult challenge. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll just note that we can think about this uh, through a couple of different lenses. So one is um, there are lots of platforms, there are lots of ways in which people, lots of lots of ba different balances that different platforms strike. Um, and at some at some level, you know if if you if you don't want to be on a platform whose policies are being set in Silicon Valley, then at some at some level, that's got to be a choice that platforms are able to make uh, about, how global or how particular they want their their policies to be. Um, there is a point at which, um, and this is certainly relevant to the oversight board, a point at which kind of global human rights standards become relevant. Right. So if we're talking about when does in, you know, what, what what counts as incitement, or if we're talking about hate speech, or we're talking about um, various kinds of, of misinformation or disinformation. Um, uh, Facebook and a number of, and mo most of the platforms that we're talking about here have committed themselves to uh, to uh, being guided by international human rights principles, and those principles uh, have have for decades now struggled with this question of how do you adapt um, broad principles to local context. There are some mechanisms for doing that. Um, 
in, in, in human rights law, we, re we sometimes refer to what's called the margin of appreciation. Um, there are other ways of, uh, of where, where you give some deference to local practices, but not too much deference. Um, I, I also, it's, all, it's also, I think, the case that when we talk about uh, about context, you know, the same piece of content might be more harmful in one context than in another context or in one geographic location than another. A word that seems, that sounds um, perfectly benign um, to an American ear translated into a, a different language or a different culture might sound very different. And so it's, it's going to be important I'm going forward, I think, to develop and continue to develop local expertise. Um, that's something that a number of platforms are working towards but aren't aren't there yet. Um, uh, uh, the Oversight Board uh, relies on local expertise um, in arriving at its own decisions, and that's something that we will be continuing to try to get better at as well. Yes, Joan? Yes, thank you. No, I just wanted to say, I mean, with regards to this, this idea of um, universality versus fragmentation, if you want that, it's true that platforms are global, that they have, let's say, a global set of community standards that are inspired, let's say, uh, and, and the First Amendment and in liberal speech traditions. But on the other hand, we also need to understand and accept that platforms accept the jurisdiction of different states states, including authoritarian states, because it's the only way for them to stay, to remain active in that state. And let's think about this very recent example of Turkey imposing on platforms certain obligations, otherwise they would have to leave, including, I mean, appointing a legal representative in the country, and most of them have accepted. Uh, and of course, I mean, the, the way, for example, speech is regulated in places like Germany or Thailand, uh, to, to just to mention two different examples, is based on the way on the legal, let's say, standards that established at the national level. So let's say platforms have accepted these and for platforms also, it's easy to say, well, sorry, we respect national legislation. What else? No, but <laughs> respecting national legislation means respecting all kinds of kinds of um, uh, legislation. The second thing that I would say with regards to, to, I mean, in this context, this debate with regards to the oversight board, and this is something that um, is, I mean, connected to the conception of the oversight board, is that unfortunately, the oversight board only takes decisions on the basis of community standards. So when there's an issue that is connected on the way the law was interpreted and applied in a certain country, then this the, the oversight board, there's nothing it can do. So, so that that is a, a problem, let's say, I mean, uh, perhaps this will change, I mean, in the future, but of course, this is a limit to, to, to this kind of, 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 of bodies that can only deal with uh, the level of community standards, but not, not another level. And last but not least, I think that when it comes to context, I think that... Um, let's say, uh, platforms still behave in a very discriminatory way. I mean, they look a lot into context, into, let's say, um, into language, etc., in places where they have the resources and the interest to invest in content moderation, whereas in other parts of the world, I mean, this same effort is not applied. I mean, that is, that is obvious. And the fact that Donald Trump has been the first uh, president to be banned, considering the very crazy things that all the presidents have been saying in the, la in the course of the last years on social media proves uh, these, let's say, I mean, uh, contrast uh, when it comes to content moderation, depending on, on the area of the world. Tiffany, you teed up uh, context and the way that Jamal and Joan have addressed it might be different than the way that Nora and I will talk about context. It isn't just uh, geographical and static cultural differences that create context. It's also the temporal context, like what is happening now? in a country. Um, are we two days before elec an election? That's going to change the context of what gets moderated. That's where the, the Hunter Biden laptop story went through that kind of a lens, right, for moderation purposes. Another would be if you, we are uh, in the middle of an insurrection or a movement that's showing violence, then suddenly the potential to incite violence is dialed way up in that temporal context. And finally, if we're in the middle of distributing vaccines after so long, and we are trying to put needles in arms, within that, within that temporal context, I think that um, misinformation, not even intentional disinformation, but misinformation about vaccines 
is certainly protected by the U.S. First Amendment and perhaps global freedom of expression. But in the temporal context of vaccine distribution in a pandemic, I think social media companies also have to consider that as context in how they regulate it. And each of them may choose to do it differently, right? And it's not something that would be subject to lawsuits where it or where misinformation spread it. And it's not something the government could crack down on, but it is something that social media platforms are going to try to be responsible for. You know, I've been sitting here thinking about um, what does thoughtful, useful fragmentation look like? Um, and what are examples in practice of context? I mean, humor is a great one, satire. You know, what lands with literally uh, Steve may not land with me, uh, you know, or with Tiffany. And so um, I think it's really hard to have such a high level conceptual conversation in some ways about context when we're not actually talking about how something will be applied, um, which is quite meta in a way. But, uh, you know, I think American exceptionalism is baked into almost all of the first tier platforms um, from an ownership perspective, um, from the way we talk about in sort of the cacophony of media and the buzz around what platforms are doing. And I think it's actually been a really meaningful several years. I would say the last five to seven years where, you know, the platforms have begun to really examine how, um, what context looks like. Uh, that there may not be fact checkers with language skills uh, for a community that literally are desperately in need of um, understanding what they're seeing. And so part of how PEN America has come to this issue and the kind of really, I think, impossible question of context is that we also have to have other types of solutions. And one of those is media literacy, that we're never going to appropriately crack the context nut. And so we need to have techniques and tools that people can use to make sense of what they see online. It's a kind of empowerment, if you will, so that in the absence of mitigating uh, mechanisms that the platforms implement, there are other things they can rely on. And I just think we're never going to reach the point, or at least not anytime soon where we feel we have appropriately dealt with context. Um, you know, we can't even get that here in the United States. Uh, so scaling that globally and for tiny communities, you know, of 140 people speaking one dialect, I think is going to be really, I mean, <laughs> insurmountable. And so I think it's really also incumbent on us to think of some of these issues as human issues and what are the human ways that we need to help, uh, you know, bootstrap up a kind of digital intelligence for people. And that's part of why we work so much on training people to identify what they see, whether it is learning how to get to the point where they know how to even flag misleading content or potentially learning how to apply a set of techniques to, um, you know, being a more credible source themselves. Yes, John? If I may just add a very, very short um, thing. Yesterday, there was, I think it was yesterday, there was a, on Lawfare, a very interesting article by Jacob Machanga, I think that's, that's his name, saying, look, I mean, judges uh, to, to decide on content cases, I mean, like hate speech, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, depending on the country, I mean, take an average of 1,000 days, 500 days, et cetera. No? And sometimes we tend to descend with the way judges have considered context. No? So now let's translate this into the world of, let's say, the way content moderation operates. And we will realize that it's absolutely, I mean, impossible to pretend that, I mean, a proper assessment, taking into account context, et cetera, et cetera, uh, is, is made. On top of that, there's also a very interesting discussion raised by the Trump case on whether context by platforms also means context within the platform or context also taking into account what happens outside the platform. Uh, it's the second then, I mean, things become far more complicated, no? And if I have to confess, and one of the reasons why I'm looking forward to the decision of the of the oversight board in the Trump case is whether it will set the standard that when analyzing content decisions, it is relevant to look into what happened inside the platform or also it is also important to look outside the platform. Well, I think, but in any case, I mean, the second option would be really challenging for platforms if applied to every single case. Can I just jump in just very briefly with, without, 
without without previewing, um, unfortunately for John, how, what we'll say in the in the Trump case, um, I, I thought I'd just make a couple of points, just of of, uh, of clarifying points. So one is just on this point about time. Uh, it, this is something that I'm very acutely aware of uh, because the nature of the oversight board is as a deliberative body. Um, that talks about content on the internet, which is not a deliberative space, right? It's a space that that operates at a much faster pace than the board does. Um, we are trying to move more quickly than the average judge would move or the average court would move, but it's it's crucial to our kind of DNA that we're a deliberative body uh, and not a not a policing body, uh, and and that's you know, trying to just add that into the mix and try to see how how we can make progress um, by adding that kind of voice into the mix. Uh, the other point I'll just make is, um, is just on, on diversity and American exceptionalism. That is certainly uh, absolutely the case uh, that the first year platforms have been, um, have been American exceptionalist. Uh, Facebook, it's no exception to that. Um, the board's trying to, 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 you know, it's a global institution, so we are members from all over the world. There is no way of getting at the granular context uh, uh, of global content issues. Um, if we, you know, we'll have 40 people at maximum strength. If we had 10,000 people, we still wouldn't be able to do that. Um, but I, but I, it, it, as I've sat on this institution, I have seen already ways in which even being from the region um, can just totally transform the way someone thinks about an issue. Uh, and to just make sure that that person's in the room when important decisions are made uh, is, is really important. Last, last minor point I'll make is just a, a point of clarification that I, I, I think we're, I think um, uh, uh, on John's point earlier about um, what the board is bound by. So we are, we can't, we can't change the national laws or, or change the interpretation of the national laws of particular jurisdictions, absolutely. Um, but we do make reference to international human rights law. So it's not just the Facebook community standards, but it's also ex external sources as well. Yeah, that's great. That's great context. Uh, thanks, Jamal. Uh, so definitely, I think we see a lot of difficulties here, right, with thinking about the sort of um, regulation coming from the law. Uh, but also regulation coming from the platforms themselves, right? Based on their own community standards, based on um, outside sources, but done internally. Um, and that's a lot of, I think, what we're going to see moving forward. We've talked a lot about many problems, the threats um, to free expression, and also these problems of context. And as Nora mentioned, scale and speed. Um, I'm glad, you know, with such an experienced panel, uh, none of you said that AI will fix this. Um, because I think we all know that there is no way to automate ourselves out of this content moderation problem, particularly given the context issues that all of you are mentioning. Uh, context in terms of location, in terms of time, on platform, off platform. Uh, so these are just thorny issues that will have to be dealt with. Uh, but I think we've been seeing a lot of innovative solutions. So the oversight board definitely is an innovative type of solution. Uh, recently, Twitter also announced uh, Birdwatch which is uh, a program that will allow users to um, kind of rate or review different tweets um, in terms of uh, whether or not <clears throat> they include misinformation or other types of harmful or bad content. It's not quite clear yet. In a prior life, I worked for the Wikimedia Foundation, which is a nonprofit that runs Wikipedia, which has a lot of internal mechanisms for fact checking, for um, community standards, uh, it's really a community-based uh, moderation and uh, regulation. Um, and we also have uh, Mike Nelson from the Carnegie Endowment in the Q&A uh, mentioned this idea that Jack Dorsey mentioned uh, last year, uh, which was having third parties providing some moderation. Um, and this maybe was related to what was announced recently. Uh, this idea of other types of content filters, or other types of content moderation. So we've seen a lot of different proposals, right? We've seen proposals from Facebook, from Twitter, from YouTube, which has added fact-checking links, for example, uh, Wikipedia, from all sorts of different platforms. Now, what I'm interested in though is what happens now? So we have these companies creating their own proposals for bettering content moderation on their own platforms and even creating some sort of oversight or regulation uh, internally for content moderation. 
At the same time, we have countries and governments like John mentioned, uh, which are trying to mandate their own standards for how content should be moderated, uh, which might not be at all reflective of what the companies are doing or what the companies can do. As you mentioned, you know, you might have, uh, you're doing the work of, you know, 10,000 judges, right? So how do we deal with this? How do we balance these two pressures that the companies have? And what's the best way forward? Do we try to clarify the legal standards from governments? Do we try to rely a bit more on companies knowing what they're doing for their own communities? You know, what's the path forward for this sort of, you know, public-private tension in terms of who makes a decision for content moderation? Ultimately, it will be based upon adverse decisions that courts make, um, new laws that a government institutes, executive orders that might shut down an entire service, uh, nationalistic policies that favor domestic social media over international. There's a whole collection of things that a government can do to push American-based content moderation behind the scenes. And... Uh, they will be successful from time to time, and therefore the platforms will have to make decisions about how much risk they want to take, how much expense they want to incur at very country-specific moderation, storing the data within a country under data nationalization laws. So these are, these are great questions, Tiffany, and yet those decisions are going to be made by each company in its own way. Jack Dorsey talked about his ideas. We've heard what Zuckerberg believes. Um, I told you what MeWe's decided to do. They've decided to just charge and not have ads. So all of these different experiments are going to be boiling along in 2021. And right in the middle of these experiments, just when you thought you could conduct an all things being equal experiment, stuff's going to happen, right? There will be incidents that will change the temporal context in a way that all of your predictions about the costs and benefits get blown up in a crisis. And part of that crisis is fed by our traditional media. The traditional media loves it when the internet-based social media struggles with these decisions because it does make, make the internet a place that's maybe a little more dangerous for audience and for advertisers. And uh, it contributes to the long-term goal of bringing audience and eyeballs back to the mainstream media. This is why you see such sensational headlines in traditional media anytime that social media is having a concern. Uh, if I may, yeah, thank you. No, I think that, I mean, now it could be interesting to mention, I mean, the kind of proportionate solution that the, the, the DSA proposal contains in this, this specific field, because in a way what, what the DSA is saying, and it, I think that this is the most interesting part of it, huh? even if it still contains controversial matters. Uh, but it says, well, you platforms, you can, you're still free to moderate content. We encourage you to moderate content beyond the law. But I mean, if we, when you do so, you need to be transparent. Huh? And this is the first time, for example, then that clear transparency obligations are set in a piece of legislation. And I think that is interesting. Uh, whether that is realistic or not, or it's sufficient or not, is something that still needs to be seen. It also says that uh, you need to have appeal mechanisms. Uh, and for example, I think that in Europe, these, uh, the way the, the, the provision is drafted, it opens the door for a market of oversight boards, of competing oversight boards, let's say. And also it says that you need to mitigate risks and you need to tell us, tell users how you mitigate risks, how you identify risks and how you mitigate risks. Well, that is interesting. It is also dangerous dangerous in terms of freedom of expression, because if it's not properly done, it is it is dangerous. But I think that here what I see is a certain tendency towards introducing structural regulations in the sense that we, I mean, states were not telling you what should delete, what should not delete, what the parameters that you should use, but are, we are telling you, I mean, how transparent you need to be, the mechanisms that you need to take in place, and the basic principles you need to apply. I mean, this is a proposal that I think I mean, some of the proposals uh, made on regarding Section 230, at least there's one that includes something similar to that. And I think that this will be the most interesting conversation around, I mean, the reform of uh, I mean, the, the Digital Services Act. And uh, many say that this can be the solution uh, when it comes to regulation, not, let's say, a targeted regulation in terms of 
attaining a certain objective. Uh, you need you must get rid of hate speech, but um, a regulation that in a way defines the behavior, the way platforms should behave when regulating content, uh, although they are still free to decide exactly which principles, which, let's say, values, I mean, govern their content regulation policies. Great, thank you. Anyone else have thoughts on that? Jamal? Uh, I'm, I, I don't really, um, in the sense, and I, I mean that as my answer, which is I don't know um, what, the, what, the, what the future holds. I, I, think, I, I think that what will be quite important is to maintain a, a spirit of experimentation and a spirit of humility, um, as Steve mentioned as well, uh, which is we don't, you know, the, 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 the challenges of a year from now are going to look different than they look right now. Um, so some of the solutions people try will be, be flops and some will, some will do better. Um, and, uh, and so I think just keeping an open mind, recognizing that these problems are hard, uh, they're not, they're not hard because, you know, someone's, someone out there is being malicious. They're hard because they're hard. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, and there are, there are perils on on all sides, um, and I, I do th I do think and I guess the one thing I'll say substantively is I I I do think that the the future uh, lies in process um, as Joanne mentioned um, in terms of uh, making sure that uh, that there are mechanisms in place to uh, allow people to know what's happening to them or to their content. Um, to be able to challenge it when they think there's a problem. Um, uh, I, I, I suspect that that's uh, coming at a broader scale than it exists right now. But again, I'll, I'll keep that spirit of humility and say, I, I really don't know. I'll add one thing, which is really about the spirit of, um, you know, R&D, if you will, and innovation. And that I think um, it's, so, it's so easy to uh, be critical of, uh, what the platforms have not done up until this point, and that there has been too little, too late. Um, I am optimistic. I'm very cautiously optimistic about Birdwatch, actually. Um, I think that at the base level, um, a process of transparency and data transparency is critical. Um, we need that across all platforms, and the processes that they go through um, should be transparent. I also think the values that are used as sort of the framework for uh, those processes need to be discussed. And, and of course, I think civil and human rights need to be elevated to an extent that they have not been. Um, and that so often those are sidelined in the way algorithms push content and that that ultimately, you know, is sort of talked about, but really by a certain set of experts and sectors. And so I think that the transparency will be critical. And frankly, as Jamal said, you know, we don't quite know. But if the question at some level is what is the tension and what will the um, public or private aspects look like? Something that tries, like Birdwatch, to merge a kind of community uh, moderation model, like Wikipedia has done, is exciting. I think that there's a reputation question, though. Um, the reputation of the Wikipedia moderators is just so strong and so community focused that, um, and Tiffany, you probably know even more than me, but it's it's something that where, you know, Twitter is a really different platform and the culture is different there. So the solutions across platforms, I think, have to take into account what those platform specific cultures are. Um, and that's also going to be, I think, a necessary discussion, but one that ultimately means we have to have nimble solutions depending on what's at stake. You know, Tiffany, the, uh, the point about, the point about uh, traditional media competing with social media gets an exclamation point when you look at the problems we had in the U.S. on election disinformation about the election being stolen. Harvard had just completed a study where they looked at the election disinformation campaign, the amplification of it. And they concluded, quote, that a highly effective disinformation campaign with potentially profound effects for both participation in and legitimacy of the 2020 election was driven by elites, was a mass media led process, and social media played only 
a secondary role, end quote. Went on to say that, quote, it's especially hard for social media to curb the spread of misinformation when the legitimate mainstream outlets are publishing it. And they did on all ends of the political spectrum. The stolen election news story, it led on both ends of the media and then in the United States. And that sort of uh, amplification is not something that social media can do too much about. It doesn't mean that social media can just let its guard down. We have to be attentive to very disruptive problems and disinformation campaigns that can, that can harm people. But at the same time, it's the mainstream media that bears an awful lot of the responsibility for what we saw. That's a really provocative statement. Thank you. Um, you know, definitely, I think that uh, what we saw last year in this in terms of misinformation, I think there are a lot of people to blame for that. And certainly, I would agree, it's not just social media platforms, right? We saw these stories published everywhere. Uh, we have a, just a few more minutes. So I would like to just close with maybe if you have just a very quick thought. We do have a new administration. We have new congressional makeup. We have all of these problems still, though. Uh, what is one thing you hope for uh, from uh, the U.S. government? Let's just keep it in the U.S. context um, in terms of, you know, what was one thing you hope for that might come out in the next few years uh, from policymakers on content moderation or on free speech online? Keep you in mind. I can take a shot at it. I, I, a real fast one. I hope that the Biden administration and everyone in Congress focuses uniformly on getting us out of this COVID crisis, the health and economic effects of this. And in doing so, they turn to the technology industry, whether it's e-commerce or information sharing, and we'll do all the help we can and try to avoid disinformation that could get in the way of that recovery. But let's get back to normal. Uh, I have two. One is, um, you know, PEN America put together a set of policy recommendations for the first hundred days of the Biden-Harris administration. One of those is the creation of a disinformation and free expression task force. Um, and so we will be pushing for that and the creation of that in the next uh, however many days it is now. Um, part of it is working with experts um, like many of the people here. I also think that we need uh, mandated media literacy curriculum in the United States um, and across various age groups. And this is sort of one of my soapboxes, but I think that, um, you know, I saw in the chat a question and sort of comment around the empowerment aspects of these tools, um, informing content, uh, educative content for users will be critical from the platforms and the government solution per Tiffany's question is really, I think to set people up um, for what is an issue and a way of life and connection that is not going away. Uh, I would say a couple of very basic things. First is that before adopting any law or regulation, think if that will be better than what you already have. Huh? And think of the implications that it may, may have. And the second thing is that don't aspire to solve deep societal issues, societal polarization by fixing platforms, because I think that you need to understand and separate the nature of, of the problem. All I wish them is wisdom. That's a very succinct answer. I also wish them wisdom. Um, I think we all need it. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists. This has been an amazing discussion. I have personally learned a lot from all of you and I hope everyone in the audience enjoyed this as well. Uh, I think, I believe there will be a recording up later um, and or a transcript, I'm not quite sure. Uh, but again, thanks for joining us and um, we'll see you throughout the rest of the day today. And I'll turn it over to the, uh, the Save the Net team now. Thank you. Thank you.